Good morning or afternoon to those of you who are listening and welcome to our webinar today. I'm Miriam Eisenberg, Manager of Food Safety and Public Health with the EcoSure Division of Ecolab. And I'm pleased to introduce you to today's speaker. Dr. Laura Brown is a behavioral scientist with the Center of Disease Control and Prevention. She has been with the CDC's National Center for Environmental Health's food safety team for 13 years. She's responsible for the application of behavioral science research methods and findings to the study of retail food safety. To that end, she has developed and implemented 13 retail food service food safety studies. She has also been primarily responsible for analysis and interpretation of the data from these studies and for the development of recommendations based on the data. Dr. Brown has worked on such diverse food safety topics as ill food workers, hand hygiene, tomato and leafy green preparation practices, and food cooling practices. And she'll be discussing a couple of these today. And with that, I welcome Dr. Laura Brown. Laura, it's the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do today is present some findings and recommendations from um, two of our studies, a study we did on ill workers in restaurants and a study on improper cooling. But first, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the work, um, the group that I work with at CDC and what our, what our goals are. I work with a group called the Environmental Health Specialist Network. Um, environmental Health Specialists are those people that work typically often in local health departments. They're responsible for food and water safety at the local and state level, and they're often um, the people that inspect restaurants and investigate foodborne illness outbreak investigations. So since 2000, CDC has funded state and local health departments um, to conduct practice-based research on retail food service, food safety policies, and practices. Um, so SNET, we call it short, Environmental Health Specialist Network, the short name for that is SNET, is a collaborative network of federal, state, and local environmental health specialists, food safety specialists, and epidemiologists. So if you look at the graph here, um, CDC actually funds, currently we're funding six state and local health departments, California, Minnesota, New York City, New York State, Rhode Island, and Tennessee, um, to work with us on this network. Um, and NCH um, is the National Center for Environmental Health. CDC is broken up into several centers, and I sit in the National Center for Environmental Health. We also work closely with USDA and FDA partners as well. So our objectives, as I said, we want to do practice-based research on retail food safety policies and practices. Um, and we want to use the information that we gain from that research to strengthen federal, state, local, and industry food safety policy and practice. So, so we want to strengthen industry practices, of course, but we also want to strengthen the practices of federal, state, and local food safety programs. So those, those people out in health departments that are responsible for inspecting restaurants and investigating outbreaks and, in, in general, keeping your food safe, we want to help them do their jobs better as well. And in the long term, we hope that this leads to a reduction in, in foodborne illness. So um, the question we sometimes get, or a question we sometimes get, is why are we focused on retail food service? Well, we know from data that are collected at CDC on outbreaks that of outbreaks that occur in just one place, in one setting, the majority of those occur in restaurants and delis. 68% occur in restaurants and delis. So it's a significant, restaurants and delis are significant uh, location for foodborne illness outbreaks. And we also know from CDC research that many of these outbreaks are caused by inadequate food safety practices in these establishments. Um, and sometimes these are called contributing factors to outbreaks. So we know that inadequate cooking, inadequate holding time and temperature, cross-contamination from raw products to ready-to-eat products or, or food contact surfaces, and poor personal hygiene are all inadequate food safety practices that have in the past been associated with outbreaks in restaurants and delis. Um, our program is a relatively small program in the whole scheme of CDC funding, so we really wanted to kind of focus where we thought we could have the most impact, and that is um, uh, in the retail food service setting. So to tell you a little bit more about our studies, we do go into restaurants, retail food service settings, and collect data on food safety policies and practices. And we do that first to identify food safety policy and practice gaps. Where could things be done better? 
And so I've included here an example from one of our earlier studies where we looked at ground beef handling practices, and we found that in 12% of restaurants, hamburgers were undercooked. So they weren't cooked to the FDA-recommended temperature. So that's a, that's a gap. We also wanted to identify ways to address those gaps. And one of the ways we do that is to look at the links between restaurant and food worker traits and those policies and practices. So, for example, in that same study, we found that chain restaurants compared to independent restaurants and restaurants with a certified kitchen manager were less likely to serve undercooked hamburgers. So these, suggest, these findings suggest a way to address this gap in hamburger undercooking. Um, so we take that information and we make policy and practice recommendations. Um, and so to sum up our recommendations from that study, we suggested that restaurant management and food safety programs consider requiring a certified kitchen manager because it seems to have a protective effect when it comes to this risk factor of undercooked hamburgers. And we also suggest that restaurant management and food safety programs develop measures to improve ground beef practices, um, focused on independent restaurants in particular because our data suggests that they, their practices um, are a little riskier than, than chain restaurants. So that sort of sums up what we're hoping to achieve when we conduct these retail food safety studies. We have conducted um, studies on a number of topics, and we've broken them out sort of to two groups. We've looked at foods that have been consistently linked with outbreaks in the past. So ground beef, chicken, eggs, leafy greens, and tomatoes. We've conducted studies on all those topics. We've also looked at practices that have been linked with outbreaks. So you'll see we have a list here, food cooling, hand hygiene, or improper or poor hand hygiene, ill workers, kitchen manager certification, microwave use, and cross-contamination. And I have these two highlighted, food cooling and ill workers, because that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, because we conduct these studies in a similar way, I'm just going to kind of give you an overview of how we do it, and this, this applies to both, both studies I'll be talking about today. Um, our data collection always involves an interview with a manager, so we almost always involve, um, always, always an interview a manager and we ask them about the characteristics of their restaurant and then we ask them about policies and practices of interest for that study. Sometimes we interview workers um, and then sometimes we do an observation in the, in the kitchen. We'll actually observe food workers washing their hands or handling food. Um, we'll also take temperatures. We might look at cooling units. So depending on the topic of the study, um, we'll do observations in the kitchen. And the data collection is actually conducted by the staff that we fund in the state and local health departments, so they're all experienced food safety professionals and know what to do in a restaurant. Uh, and we usually collect data in between 300 and 400 restaurants, and they're randomly selected within our SNET sites. As with any studies, our studies do have a couple of limitations. I see our primary limitation being that we only collect data in establishments with an English-speaking manager. We don't really have the resources at this point to, um, to do translations and hire translators. Um, so the result of this limitation is that our data may not represent restaurants without English speakers, and we know there are restaurants without English speakers out there. Um, and as with any data collection method, the data collection methods we use could be subject to some biases. So, for example, our interview data could be subject to the social desirability bias, whereas people really want to talk, tell the interviewer sort of what the right answer is, what the socially acceptable answer is, rather than what's really happening. Our data could also be subjected to the observation bias. Um, I'm sorry to the reactivity bias. Um, we know that sometimes when people are being observed and know they're being observed, they can react to that observation. They can behave differently. And, and in our example, it may be that they handle food better or safer than they might normally would. Um, and so these biases could lead to overestimates of safe food preparation practices in their studies. Um, there are, however, steps that you can take to combat these biases. And primarily, one of the primary ones is to collect anonymous data. So there is no way for you to link the data that you collect with um, any individual names or restaurants. Um, and we know that if you collect anonymous data and the people that you're talking to, your respondents, know that you're collecting anonymous data, 
they're more likely to be to give you sort of the truth, to talk to you about what's really happening and to act the way they really would when they feel confident that no one's going to be able to link what they say to, um, to the, back to them. And we do a good job of that. We do always collect anonymous data, and we make sure that our respondents know that. Okay, so um, let's move on to talking about specific studies, and we'll start with our ill worker study. What I'll do is give you a little bit of background on what the issue is and why we decided to focus on this. Then I'll tell you what some of our findings were, and then I'll tell you about our primary recommendations based on those findings. So we decided to focus on ill workers because contamination of food by an ill worker is a cause of almost half of all retail-related outbreaks. So it is really a significant issue. Now, the FDA makes recommendations for how to um, reduce the risk of foodborne illness from ill workers. And they make these recommendations in the model food code. And I'm assuming that most of you, you know what that is, but I'll, I'll just give a quick summary. Um, the FDA has developed a model food code that includes a number of guidelines and recommendations for how to handle food safely in a retail environment. And most state and local food codes or food laws are based in some part on this model food code. So what the model food code recommends in this department is that food workers should be required to tell the manager if they have symptoms of foodborne illnesses um, or symptoms of illnesses that can be transmitted through food is another way to say that. And the food code focuses on four symptoms, vomiting, diarrhea, sore throat with fever, and jaundice. Um, so the, the primary focus is on those symptoms. Our second recommendation, of the, F, the model food code's second recommendation is that management should exclude food workers who are experiencing these symptoms. And what we mean by that is if, if a worker has one of these symptoms, that they could be a symptom of a food burn illness, then they should not be working in the establishment. And then the third one is um, the FDA food code makes recommendations for how long workers should be prevented from working, and that, that depends on the symptom um, and, and other circumstances. Um, so in general, what's important to note here is also that um, the food code really recommends that managers play an active role in the decision about whether or not a food worker should work, and they should base that decision on information that they attain from the worker. What are their symptoms? Are they, do, is it possible that they have a food burn illness? So um, the purpose of this study mirrors the purpose of all our studies that I showed you earlier. We want to identify gaps in restaurant ill worker policies and practices. And where appropriate, we look at policies and practices in comparison to what the FDA recommends. We also want to identify ways to address those gaps. Um, and then we want to make policy and practice recommendations based on our data. So let's move into the findings. On this slide, you'll see data that we collected from managers. Um, at the top, you'll see, um, and, and in this manager interview, we asked a lot of questions about their policies and about their ill worker policies. So 69% of managers said that their restaurant did have a policy that in some way excluded ill workers. So of, those 69, of that 69%, we asked specific questions about the policies. So you'll see that in 27% of those policies, it did not specify symptoms requiring exclusion. So the policy didn't say, if the food worker has vomiting or diarrhea or jaundice, then they should not work. It didn't specify specific symptoms. And 18% of um, restaurants and, and policies, the policy did not specifically list vomiting or diarrhea. And 47%, almost half, the policy didn't list fever or sore throat. 98% did, basically none of the policies said anything about jaundice. And then about half of the policies did not talk about how long a food worker should be prevented from working if they have those symptoms. So here you'll see some gaps in the policies that restaurants have, some definite places where the policies could be improved. And in this study, we also interviewed workers. And what we wanted to do when we talked to the workers was just kind of get a good picture of what, was ha what happens in the restaurant when a worker is sick. So we sort of asked big bigger picture general questions to get a sense of what happens. Um, so we asked workers if they could remember a time that they had worked while sick, and 60% said that they could. 
89% said it was their decision to work, not the manager's. Um, and again, this goes back to who's, who's making the decision about who, who should work and who shouldn't work when they're sick, and is the decision based on public health implications. And 37% of workers said their manager did not know what their symptoms were when they were working while sick. Then we asked workers uh, just an open-ended question. In that situation, why did you work while you were sick? 44% said that um, they worked while sick because there was no paid sick leave or there wasn't a sick leave policy in their restaurant. 32% said the restaurant was shorthanded and there was no one else that could take their shift. Um, 31%, about a third, said they worked because they didn't think their symptoms were that bad. They didn't think they were contagious. And then 31% said they worked because they had a strong sense of duty. They had a strong work ethic. They were going to work no matter how sick they were. And note that this, these percentages add up to one, more than 100% because they could give more than one reason for why they worked while sick. Then we asked them about specific factors. So this first question was, why did you work while sick? Then we asked them about very specific factors and how they influenced their decisions to work while sick. So we asked them how much the severity of their symptoms or the type of their symptoms impacted their decisions. And a majority, 71%, said that this was a significant factor in their decisions. 71% said whether or not they could make others ill was a significant factor in their decisions. 65% said the dedication to their job or their work ethic was a significant factor. 60% said their concern about leaving their coworkers short-staffed. They didn't want to leave their, sh their coworkers without, you know, sh missing a staff member. So 60% said that was an issue. 49% mentioned not getting paid as an issue that influenced their decisions. And then finally, 26% said fear of losing their job if they missed a shift because they were sick influenced their decisions. Then we asked workers a very specific question, and we did this near the end of the interview. We asked them if they had worked a shift in the last year with the specific symptoms of vomiting or diarrhea. 20% of the food workers said that they had done that at least once. Then we looked at characteristics of the restaurant and characteristics of the worker um, to see how they were associated with those reports. And we did see some significant findings here. We found that workers that had more job duties, basically they had more responsibilities in the restaurant, they were more likely to say that they had worked with vomiting or diarrhea in the past year. Workers, similarly, workers with more experience were more likely to say that they had worked with vomiting or diarrhea. So this suggests to us that um, workers that have a lot of responsibilities in the establishment may either be less likely they, they may feel like they can't not work because the restaurant would fall apart, or, or it may be that their manager is less likely to let them stay home because they feel like they need them. Workers who were afraid of losing their job and said that that influenced their decisions about whether or not to work while ill, they were more likely to have said they had worked while ill. And then workers that had concerns about short staffing, workers who um, didn't want to leave their coworkers short-staffed, and that concern um, influenced their decisions to work while ill, those workers are more likely to say that they had worked while ill in the past year. And then there were some restaurant characteristics associated with this behavior. Um, restaurants that served more meals, so they're bigger restaurants, possibly or busier restaurants, those restaurants are more likely to have workers um, say that they had worked while ill. Um, and again, this may be a function of um, the restaurant and the worker may feel like they can't, they can't function without, without that worker, that they have to have him there, him or her there. Um, we asked about policies requiring sick workers to tell their manager that they were sick. Workers that worked in restaurants that did not have this policy were more likely to say they had worked while ill. So this finding suggests that this policy does actually provide a protective effect against workers working while ill, that it may help prevent workers from working when they shouldn't. We also asked about on-call staffing plans. So basically we asked the manager if the restaurant had on-call workers in case somebody called in sick or couldn't make it to work. Restaurants that did not have this staffing plan, workers in those restaurants were more likely to say that they had worked while ill. And again, this suggests there's a protective effect here that, that Restaurants that sort of actively manage their staffing situation and, and help make it easier for someone to not come in if they shouldn't, those restaurants 
have workers that are less likely to say they'd worked while ill. And then finally, we asked about manager experience, and we found that restaurants, that workers in restaurants that had less experienced managers were more likely to work while ill. So those workers were working with managers that may not have, have known whether or not the worker could work while ill, or they may not have been actively involved in the decision for the worker to work while ill. So those were our primary findings, um, and we did make a number of recommendations for um, food safety programs and for restaurants, and I've tried to summarize them here on this slide. Our primary, one of our first conclusions was that most restaurants' ill worker policies are inadequate. They, most restaurants have a policy, but those policies are typically missing some critical component that the FDA thinks needs to be there. So our recommendation here is that restaurant management should create and food safety programs should encourage comprehensive ill worker policies that address these exclusion symptoms. So that really needs to, to be an, um, something that is focused on in the future. Um, another of our conclusions was that our managers, the restaurant managers are not usually involved in the decisions about whether or not a worker should work while ill, and they don't usually know the ill worker's symptoms. Um, so this definitely um, does not support the FDA recommendation that, act, that managers need to be actively involved. They need to make the decision based on the worker's symptoms. So again, our recommendations focus on ensuring that managers are involved in decisions about whether ill workers should work. And one of the steps um, that our data suggests can be helpful here is to actually have a policy that if someone is sick, they need to talk to the manager about it, they need to tell the manager about it, and then the manager can be involved in the decision. And we also found that many food workers work when they're ill, and they mentioned several reasons for that. Some of them were personal, some of them were financial, and some of them were social. Um, so our recommendations focus on um, ensuring that restaurant management and food safety programs focus on actions that ease the pressure for workers to work when they're ill. So I think one of the best examples here is the fact that having on-call workers reduces the number of employees who are working while ill. So a worker can call in and say, hey, I'm sick, I can't come in, I'm vomiting, and they know that there's an on-call worker who can take their place. So they know they're not leaving the restaurant short-staffed. And the manager knows that, hey, it's okay if this person doesn't come in, I can still function. And we also think um, there should be a focus on education on the importance of not working while sick. Some workers seem to think that being a good worker, having a strong work ethic, means that you work no matter how sick you are. So we need to change that around a little bit and ensure that workers know if you want to be a good worker, there are some situations in which you should not work. If you have symptoms of an illness that might make others sick, then being a good worker in that situation means you don't come to work. Okay, so that was um, our ill worker study. Um, and now I want to talk about our food cooling practices study. Um, Again, I'll give you a background, I'll tell you about our findings, and then I'll summarize our recommendations for you. Um, so we know that at least in some restaurants, they, um, they, they cook large pots of food. Um, so for example, you cook a large pot of soup. Now if you cook soup to a high enough temperature, you can kill a lot of, the, of any bacteria that that food might be contaminated with. But there are some bacteria that are heat resistant and spore forming, and those bacteria can survive the cooking process. Because of this, it's important to cool that hot food quickly. So if those bacteria survive the cooking process, and then it takes them a long, that food a long time to cool down, then the food could potentially be in, and I'm sure most of you have heard of this, the temperature danger zone for a long period of time. The temperature danger zone is the temperature range where bacteria can flourish, can really go very quickly. And that temperature zone is between 41 degrees and 135 degrees. So if you don't cool hot food quickly, it can be in that temperature zone for a long period of time, and then you can have a lot of bacterial growth. And two of the common bacterial bacteria that can thrive in this situation is C. perfringens and Bacillus cirrus. We also know that about 46% of restaurants' outbreaks annually are the result of this improper slow cooling of hot food. So we know this is an issue. 
And as with ill workers, the FDA model food code makes recommendations about um, how to prevent food, how to reduce this risk factor of improper food cooling. And I've listed those here. Um, the primary one is, of course, to cool cooked food rapidly. And then they specify from 135 degrees to 70 degrees in two hours, and then from 70 degrees to 41 degrees in four more hours. Um, so essentially, you need to get the food down to 41 degrees in six hours. The FDA food code also recommends that restaurants test and verify their cooling processes. So that means the restaurant says, okay, this is how I'm going to cool this hot food, and then I'm going to test the temperatures over a time period to make sure that the food actually does get to the recommended uh, temperature at the right time, in the right amount of time. Uh, the food code also recommends sort of as a further safeguard that restaurants monitor their food cooling time and temperature. So um, they need to come in and periodically check the temperature of the food to make sure that it is indeed cooling down in that six-hour period. And then the FDA food code makes recommendations about um, how, what methods they can use to cool the food that will facilitate cooling. So, for example, they recommend that you refrigerate food at 41 degrees to facilitate the cooling process and that you do that in shallow pans. So if you put the food in shallow pans, um, that will facilitate cooling. Um, they also recommended several methods that, again, are focused on facilitating heat transfer, so getting the heat out of the food. So one of those is to ventilate containers. So don't, don't um, put a tight lid on, on hot food. You want to leave it open in some way so that the, the heat can escape. Um, and then another option is to stir food frequently, and they also recommend ice baths, or ice baths where you put a pan of food in, in another pan filled with ice and water. Um, again, methods that are just focused on helping the food cool faster. Again, this study has essentially the same purposes as our other studies. We want to identify food cooling policy and practice gaps, and where appropriate, we'll look at policies and practices in comparison to what the FDA food code recommends. Um, we want to identify ways to address those gaps, and then we want to make policy and practice recommendations based on those gaps. All right, so um, this slide um, is, a set, is from, it's on our, based on our findings from this study, and this is again from the manager interview. So we asked the manager a number of questions about their cooling processes. Um, and 14% said that they had no formal cooling processes. And by that, we mean they, they had it, they knew how they were going to cool food. They cooked the hot soup, and then they were going to do this, this, and this to get it cool in the right amount of time. 14% of restaurants said they had no formal cooling processes. 9% said they had no cooling training. They didn't provide training to their food workers. And that's actually not a bad number if you think about it. 91% of restaurants, they did provide this training. However, in 61% of restaurants, um, the manager said they did not test or verify their processes. So they had no particular confidence that their process was actually cooling food to the right temperature in the right amount of time. And then 41% said um, that they did not monitor the time and temperature of foods as they were cooling. So again, we've identified some gaps in cooling practices um, that we'd like to see addressed. Now in this study, we were able to actually do um, conduct observations. Um, so what we did, what our uh, data collectors did, is looked at all, all foods that were cooling in the restaurants at the time that they were visiting the restaurant. And we collected a number of data points on this particular topic, and I've just presented three here. Um, so you'll see that in 39% of the foods that were cooling, um, the data collectors saw no evidence that the, food was being that the food's time or temperature was being monitored. Um, and 39% of cooling foods, um, the food depth was not shallow. And then in 34% of those cooling foods, the food was not ventilated to facilitate uh, the cooling process. So again, we see some gaps here, some places where we could improve our practices. <laughs> 
Now, we also were able to actually take the temperatures of the foods that were cooling at the time of our visit. Now, we weren't able to stay in the establishment for six hours. No, no manager is going to let us stay in the restaurant for that long. So we took a temperature of the cooling food at the beginning of our visit, and then we took a temperature of all the cooling foods at the end of our visit. And our visits were about, on average, 80, 80 minutes long, so almost an hour and a half. Um, and so what we did is we took these temperature data to an expert on cooling, Don Schaffner at Rutgers University, um, and what he did was estimated from those two temperatures how long it would take the food to cool to 41 degrees. Uh, so keep in mind that these data are estimates, but they are, they're based on two real um, temperature points. And what we found here was that 65% of the foods that we collected temperatures on met FDA guidelines. So that meant it looked pretty good. It looked likely that they were going to reach 41 degrees in the six hours. 35% of the foods were cooling slower than the FDA guidelines. Um, and in fact, 20%, one in five, were it was going to take them a much longer than six hours to get to uh, 41 degrees. So in about a, third, uh, about a third of the foods that we looked at were not going to cool at the FDA recommended time and temperature. Okay, one more set of findings from this study. We then looked at how those cooling rates were linked with cooling practices. So I'll just walk you through th these data points. Um, foods that were not monitored, so their time and temperature were not monitored according to our observations, those foods were more than twice as likely to cool slower than the FDA guideline. So if you reverse that, foods that were monitored were more likely to cool at the FDA guideline or quicker. Um, foods that were cooling in not shallow food depths, so the pans were full of, had high levels of food as opposed to shallow levels of food, those foods were twice as likely to cool slower than the FDA guideline. Um, and then foods that were not ventilated, so foods that were basically covered really tightly, were almost twice as likely to cool slower than the FDA guideline. So the primary takeaway point from this is that these FDA-recommended practices do indeed help food cool more quickly. Another point to make here is that monitoring seems to be sort of the, the most effective practice. It gives you the more bang for your buck. Um, it had the most impact on cooling rates. So on this slide, you'll see sort of a summary of our recommendations from the study. Um, primarily, we saw that restaurants that were following FDA-recommended practices showed faster cooling times, um, and that's important. Um, so we recommend um, that restaurant management should be following FDA recommendations. They should be monitoring food cooling time and temp. They should be storing foods at shallow depths, and they should be ventilating food. Um, and we also have recommendations for food safety programs. So here you'll see I have STLT, which stands for State, Tribal, Local, and Territorial Food Safety Programs. That's those four types of food safety programs are, are often the focus here at CDC. Um, so we recommend that those food safety programs should focus on these practices during their inspections. So if a restaurant's not monitoring their food cooling time and temperature, they're not storing food at shallow depths, they're not ventilating food, those can really be markers of a slow, slower cooling process. So they should be of a concern to an inspector. They should, this might give them an opportunity to talk to the restaurant manager about how they might improve their cooling process. And it's really difficult for an inspector to assess a six-hour cooling process. They, they don't realistically have the time to um, take a temperature at the beginning of the cooling process and come back six hours later to see if the, cool, the food cooled quickly enough. Um, so that's not practical. But looking at whether or not the food time and temperature is being monitored, whether or not the food is stored at shallow depths, whether it's being ventilated, those are things that an inspector can assess fairly quickly on an inspection, and that can give them some idea of what's going on with the cooling process. Now, I don't have it listed here, but we did see some gaps in, term, in, um, in cooling policies and practices, and one of our other recommendations is that uh, restaurants and food, food safety programs take a look at those gaps and see um, and have that guide um, they're thinking about how they're going to cool their food and how they can cool, how they can improve their cooling process.
I know that was a lot of information in a relatively short period of time. Um, I do want to point out here that I've included our, our website address. And if you'll go to this website, there's a lot of links there, and they'll take you to pretty much anything that you want. So if you go here, um, you'll, you can find the links to the cooling study. You can find the links to the ill worker study. You can find the links to all of the studies that we've conducted. And what you'll see is the actual scientific article, but we also have developed what we are calling plain language summary. So we've sort of taken the 10-page dense scientific article and tried to condense it down to sort of the most important things that a food safety program or a restaurant manager might want to know. So we've summarized those 10-page scientific articles to one or two or three pages at the most of the findings and the recommendations. So I encourage you to go out there. There's some good information out there. Um, I'll stop talking now and see if there's any questions. Thank you very much, Laura. That was really a lot of interesting information. Uh, a number of questions have come in, and um, I guess the, the first one you know, is revolving around managers and you know, what, what are they allowed to ask their employees. Can restaurant managers ask workers about illness symptoms if they see someone who they think doesn't look quite well? Um, you know, is it allowed to just say to someone, you know, what's going on? Is that any invasion of privacy, basically? Yeah, I get that question a lot. Um, there is some concern about either the HIPAA regulations or about uh, ADA, the American Disability Act. The HIPAA regulations don't really apply in this situation. They primarily apply to um, physicians, healthcare workers, and their patients. Um, so that's not an issue, and the American Disabilities Act does not apply either. In fact, there's a specific section in the American Disability Act that says, you know, this doesn't apply in a public health situation such as when an ill worker is working in a restaurant. So it is perfectly okay if, if a manager has a public health concern or reason, it's perfectly okay for them to ask their food workers what their illness symptoms are. Okay. And um, it's kind of a follow-up to that. Um, you, you had mentioned about managers' training in terms of understanding basically what the symptoms should be. Um, you know, in terms of what you're familiar with, is there actual training in terms of recognizing ill workers or, because um, I know the food code has a lot of detail about exclusion uh, and symptoms. But is there, I guess, is there adequate training in terms of managers understanding what they're looking for and how to work with the ill workers and getting them back to work after they're symptom-free? Yeah, that's a, a really good question, um, and it's a hard one to answer because, of course, training does vary quite a bit from establishment to establishment. I will say that um, kitchen manager certification, where the manager takes training, accredited training, and then takes a test, um, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, the certification training does talk about ill workers. It talks about what symptoms are a problem and why ill workers are a problem. Um, but as far as I can recall, it doesn't really um, focus a whole lot on training managers to recognize ill workers. Um, so I think, um, I think there's probably not a lot of training on that in general. Um, and so I guess I would say that I think the focus should be on maybe implementing policies and, and making sure that food workers know about the policies that, hey, if I'm sick, I have to tell my manager. And then my manager might ask me some questions and decide whether or not I can work. So I think although managers have to make the decisions, they have to be actively involved, there also has to be a piece where workers know their responsibility as well. Thank you. Um, if I can add a comment, um, I once heard a presentation that emphasize don't just say to your workers, have you been sick, but to use the words vomiting, diarrhea, fever, sore throat, so to be specific about what, what sick might mean. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Okay. Um, can you give some best practices about what proper um, food depth means when you talk about shallow food depth and also when you talk about proper ventilation? What are some best practices? Um, that's a good question. Um, 
as well. The FDA food code doesn't specifically define what shallow means. Some of the studies that they based their um, recommendations on focused on four inches, the four inches or less versus more than four. In our study, we looked at three inches. We decided that anything that was below three inches, three inches or below, was shallow because we felt like that was a very clear, if the food is at three inches or less, it is definitely shallow. Um, the FDA, again, does not make specific recommendations about what shallow means. Our study finds that three inches is, 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 is shallow and promotes, promotes food cooling. Um, and in terms of ventilation, that's, that can be an issue because when you're storing food, for example, in a cooler, um, you want to be sure that other types of foods aren't contaminating that food, that they aren't dripping into the food, for example. Um, so there, that, that can be a little tricky. So you want to keep the food protected from contamination, but you also don't want it to be, um, you know, closed up tight so, so then it won't cool. Um, and the food code doesn't address this much. It, it does say loosely covered. And so I think um, what we've seen in restaurants when this is done properly, so they might have um, saran wrap on the cover, the top of the food, um, but it's loosely covered. It's not airtight so that there is a way for the heat to escape. So I, I guess I would say that would be one potential way to, to ventilate properly. Okay. There was a similar comment uh, from one of our attendees that, you know, sometimes even loosely covering doesn't allow the hot air to escape. And then when, is it acceptable, and, and I think I understand what they mean, is it acceptable to have a drip pan or cover above cooling food in a walk-in cooling unit? And um, that may be what we see sometimes, like with um, rolling racks where there's pan above pan above pan of similar items that are all cooling. Is that a practice that you're familiar with and have any comment about? I mean, I think that sounds fine. I would have to, to just clarify that by saying that um, state and local food codes vary by jurisdiction, and it's possible that a food code might, like in one jurisdiction, say that's okay and one might not. But from my perspective, that sounds appropriate. Okay. And when at EcoSure with our evaluations, we also accept that. Uh, as well. Um, did your study look at any variation between commercial refrigeration and perhaps home style type refrigeration? Because sometimes you do see um, more domestic type refrigeration being used, especially in the uh, more mom and pop type facilities. That's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that every in every restaurant we conducted the study and they did they had essentially commercial commercial refrigeration. Um, so I don't think we had the opportunity to make those kinds of comparisons. Okay. Now, and in terms of a given location coming up with uh, with their procedures for cooling, you know, how do you recommend that? Um, these standards be set up, especially when cooling is done overnight? Um, so you ask me how I recommend that a restaurant cool their food, essentially? Well, but how do they know, I guess, what the question means is, you know, if, if they're putting hot food away at night, how do they verify that their cooling practices are working? So how, besides saying, okay, I'm going to do a shallow, um, you know, shallow layer here, uh, are there any particular procedures that they should go so that they know that their their procedures are actually working at two hours and six hours? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I know often cooling occurs at night. And I guess I, my first recommendation would be that you have to test and verify it the first couple of times you do it. So, you know, I don't know if that means you stay up all night the first couple of times and sort of, you know, to take the temperatures of the food at, at periodic times. Um, or you could, there is some technology that allows you to um, sort of put a, t a thermometer in the food and it takes automatic temperatures and creates a log for you. But I guess my primary recommendation is that if you test and verify it at the beginning, you can feel a lot more confident that it's going to work. You know, if you have the data to suggest that, you know, that points out, yes, you did cool this food um, in the right time and to the right temperature and it happened several times using this process and this process 
it's a good process. It's working. Okay, so so either someone could stay up all night, or they could perhaps, <laughs> or if they could perhaps reproduce um, that situation yeah, could, and do some daytime testing. Exactly. Yes, that's a better idea. <laughs> okay. Very good. Um, so you covered the ability to ask employees regarding specific of illness and symptoms once they're hired. Does this extend to asking potential food handler employees at the recruitment stage whether they have any illness or symptoms? Mm, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that question. I mean, if you're asking about, um, you know, a specific symptom, a foodborne illness symptom, that's okay. If you're asking about a chronic, a chronic disease, so for example, if you're asking if they have if they're HIV positive or something like that, I think that falls into a different category, so I'm not, not sure I can answer that question, but it's a good one, and I'll have to go find the answer. Okay. If there, I guess I, I'm not familiar with that either. Um, just wondering if there were any other comments there. Um, you know, in terms of Spanish-speaking managers uh, and, and their level of knowledge in handling this situation, is there any kind of reach outreach that's being done to help those who are not English speakers with being able to properly monitor in these situations, whether it's cooling or with ill workers? Um, we are doing a little bit of that here at CDC. Um, that's primarily done, though, at the state and local health departments. So um, state and local health departments, depending on the population that they serve, do translate their their resources into different languages. Um, and in some cases, CDC funds that effort, but it really does happen more often that level. Now, we are starting up a new round of our environmental specialist network, and we are going to be focusing this time around on um, establishments that may not have managers that speak English. So definitely we'll be focusing more on Spanish-speaking establishments and maybe one or two other languages. So we are trying to address that in our research program going forward. Thank you. And uh, what do you think about applying recording thermometer technology for cooling? I think that's a good idea. I do think there are some really good um, thermometers with that enhancement, and I think um, that does allow you to monitor your time and temperature, and you don't have to worry about whether or not you forget or you get busy and the food worker forgets. You have that technology in place to, to take the temperatures. Oh, very good. Um, another question, this one might be a little on the political side. Um, what are you hearing in terms of um, the current movement, I guess, to move toward uh, health coverage and sick days for food workers? Um, well, our food workers, a significant percentage of food workers did tell us that whether or not they're going to get paid does influence their decisions to work while ill. And there's no doubt about that. Food workers said that was important. But food workers also mentioned other things. And in fact, when we looked at their, the food workers' reports of whether or not they had worked while ill, that behavior was not related to whether or not they had paid sick leave. Now, that doesn't mean it's not important. Um, it's just, it, it, but it, I think what our data are telling us is that that's not the only, that it's not a silver bullet, that providing sick leave will then eliminate all ill worker situations. Um, now, I'm not saying I don't think paid sick leave for ill workers is a good idea, but I think when we're talking about whether or not it's going to prevent entirely workers working while they're ill, I'm not sure that's going to just absolutely completely solve the problem, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, do you know how common having on-call employees is? You know, that, that seemed to be a, a good solution that you mentioned, but I'm wondering how, you know, how often are extra staff people available? What, what have you heard about that? I can tell you in our study about 30% of the restaurants that we collected data in, 25 to 30% had um, on-call staffing situations. Um, and I do think that's a really, uh, I think it, that has a lot of potential for helping with, with ill workers. Now, I don't know 
I don't, I don't know of any data sort of on a national bigger level than air studies on that particular topic. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, and then there's another question about um, the geographic locations of this study. Was this representative of the whole U.S. or was it geographically, um, was it more regional? So we collected data in restaurants in, in, a, in, diverse, in a diverse parts of the country. So Minnesota, New York City, New York State, Rhode Island, Tennessee, and California. Um, and we do collect data in randomly selected restaurants. So that means we take all the restaurants in um, the jurisdiction in Tennessee and we just randomly pick restaurants to collect data in. So from that perspective, this is a fairly representative sample. So it's randomly selected and it is in um, varied parts of the country. Okay, thank you. Does an asymptomatic worker that had uh, tuberculosis or hepatitis C have to be excluded? You know, the, the, F, the food code does make specific recommendations about these and my recommendation in, in a specific situation like this is one, to review the food code in your site but also to call your health department. They are really, your food safety program people in the health department are really the best resources for dealing with specific situations like this. Okay. Um, there's a question here, who creates the policies? I'm not exactly sure if they're talking about based on the food code or who within the company creates policies. Do you have any um, general comments in terms of, I know you mentioned certain policies are missing. Yeah, so um, just to do the big picture, the FDA food code, which recommends specific policies, that is for the most part based on research. So it is evidence-based guidelines in the FDA food code. Now, the FDA develops the food code, but they do rely quite a bit on, on science conducted by um, CDC and academia. Um, and then if you go down to, um, like, chain restaurants, their corporations typically have a group that creates um, the policies for that corporation, and those policies should be based on the FDA food code and on science, the, sci the existing science um, that's out there. And I think um, perhaps this kind of situation is... is it's harder for sort of independent restaurants, the mom and pop restaurants who might not have corporate resources to rely on, so they have to decide, you know, how am I going to meet my state and local jurisdictions food food codes? You know, do I need what kind of policies do I need to create that can have to do it? Um, they don't have as many resources, I guess, to do that. But but it would be up to them to create these establishment policies that would ensure food safety in their restaurants. Thank you. Um, now, the, um, our presentation will be available for rebroadcast um, later on this week. Someone's also asking if this is available on the CDC link. Um, I, I, I mean, I could investigate if there's a, we could link to, if you have it on your website at Ecolab, we could certainly link to it. Okay, yeah, this, this actually gets loaded to a YouTube location. I don't know if they're oh, okay. looking at the actual PowerPoint presentation. Oh, um, well, I'm happy to send it out. I'll have to, I'll have to look into whether or not we can post it. That's like a whole other thing. <laughs> okay. And um, are inspectors checking to see if the health policies are regularly updated and the procedures when they come in because they're not going to see the actual cooling process? So what, what will they typically look at in terms of cooling policies and also if they have uh, proper illness reporting um, policies and recording in place? Um, well, um, what inspectors look for when they go into restaurants depends on their state, their jurisdictional food code. I would guess that, and that does vary. It does vary from state to state and county to county, or can vary. So whatever is in their food code, whatever is on their inspection report, guides what the inspector does in the restaurant. But I would, I would guess that most inspection reports do have an item on proper food cooling because it is a risk factor for foodborne illness. 
And I would guess that most of them also do ask about health policies. You're right. It's very difficult to, you know, come in and look to see if you've got ill workers, but they can ask whether or not they're appropriate policies. Um, and that inspectors do have a lot of leeway in, you know, what they do in an establishment. So some may, may look at those things and some may not. Well, thank you. It, it, it sounds like it's important for the chains to work um, you know, with all of their locations to have proper policies and guidance for both of these very important topics. And, and Dr. Brown, I'd like to thank you so much for an informative presentation and for answering so many of these questions. Um, there's always more that we can learn and do better, so thank you so much. And thank so, you. And Thanks for the opportunity to present today. Well, thank you. A recording of this presentation will be available this Friday, and if you go to ecolab.com slash media dash center slash presentations, or if you go to ecolab.com and then the search box put in webinars, that will also take you there as well. And please join us next month um, where Frank Giannis, Vice President of Food Safety and Health from Walmart, will be talking about food safety equals behavior. It should be an, another great topic to listen to. And don't forget, when you close out of the presentation, uh, don't hurry away too quickly. The survey will pop up, and that is where you request your continuing education certificates. And we look forward to speaking to you again on July 21st, and I hope that the summer weather is treating you better than it did in Chicago yesterday. So uh, thank you all so much, and uh, enjoy your day. Thank you.